my name is Philippe Loeb. I'm in charge of uh, Roman Lifestyle at Dassault System. Uh, and I'm, I have the privilege of being the panelist for this, uh, for this session. Of course, our customers uh, here are the most important people in the room. Uh, I will start this session just with a small uh, story that happened to me this morning. We were going through the booth, uh, you know, looking at many kinds of uh, new innovations. And somebody from my team, actually Lorian, sitting here, told me, hmm, every year, you know, we heard more and more about AI, artificial intelligence. And as a matter of fact, it's not AI anymore, it's artificial emotion. And we believe that when it comes to a great product experience, somehow the human emotion is what is making the difference between a good, a poor, or a fantastic experience. So today's team is about human. We're going to go through a, a round table, a discussion about human. It's going to be very diverse because you will see that those great companies represented today are in very, very different fields uh, from, uh, from the world of uh, uh, fantastic porcelain from Bernardo, incredible tools from Stanley, uh, Black & Decker, and of course, the office furniture I'm using every day from Novistil. Uh, they all have in common to, to put the human at the center of the design and, and to be working not on great product design, but delivering outstanding product experiences, human experiences. So with this, I will let the speakers introduce themselves. Hélène, you are first. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak about a material that is not very well known, which is porcelain. And um, I work for a company called Bernardo, who makes porcelain in Limoges, in France. And it's, um, it's a company that was born in 1863. That means that we are more than 150 years old. And um, why do we make porcelain in Limoges? The reason is that in 1768, the key ingredient to make porcelain was found there. It was kaolin, this amazing white clay that makes porcelain so hard, so white, so translucent, so sonorous, which is all the qualities of porcelain. Um, we are still a family business. Our CEO is Michel Bernardo, the fifth generation today. And we employ 400 person in the manufacture and we make about two and a half million pieces. So you will see it's very little comparing to the people next to me. But even so, we are a major actor in Limoges, uh, France. So our DNA is really know-how, creation, and innovation, but um, I would like now to show you a little film that explains in three minutes what we do. Everything always starts with creating a shape in plaster. All the engra engraving that we do on a plate or on a piece is always hand engraved, as you can see it here. Porcelain is a mixture of 50% kaolin, 25% feldspar, which is a clay, and 25% quartz. And that paste is used in three shapes, liquid, as you've just seen, or in plastic shape, or even in powder, depending on the shape of the piece you want to do. To create one piece, 50 hands is going to touch it. And just to make the white of porcelain, you need about one week. This is probably one of the most beautiful gestures 
in porcelain making, which is the glazing. Everything is made by hand. And the first firing at 1,000 degrees allows, as you can see, it, for the glaze to go deep into the clay very quickly. A second firing, 1,400 degrees, will allow the porcelain to have all its qualities. And to know if a cup is good to go, the only way is with a sound. So this girl hit the cup with a pen, and depending on the sound, the cup go into the bin or goes into production. The way we create our patterns is with serigraphy using metallic oxides, colors that you only can see after the firing. And what is brown here is the gold, 24 carats gold. Every piece is hand finished by hand this way. It takes about two years to be able to do exactly what it's doing now. And once you fire the piece, the gold doesn't shine. So you have to make it shine with a cloth, some water and some sand. You sand the gold, which then becomes all bright. So, most of the people think that porcelain is what you see on the screen, tableware, which, which is very true, of course. But porcelain today is also an expected thing, like jewelry that you can see on the top left, with a collaboration we just made with Iris Apfel, a very famous um, fashion icon. Or we can do, for example, um, ballistic, like this helmet, bulletproof jacket, and so on. People have no idea that porcelain can be made for that. Or you can do also the, um, um, you can use it on um, buildings, on the facade. This is the law court in, in Limoges that we've made three years ago and porcelain hasn't moved at all. We can make lightings like this lamp that you can see on the top right, or a limited edition that looks like metal, this bright pink that was made with um, Jeff Kuhn. So porcelain has um, different ways of expressing itself. We will talk about that um, later, but tableware is not only the uh, way of using porcelain. Thank you, Helen. You already set the tone for a very human touch <laughs> in the presentation and the question. We'll come back to you later. The second one, very different world. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from Thomas, totally. Thomas Valet, <laughs> adding innovation <laughs> at Stanley, Black and Decker. Thomas? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the floor. You're welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Thomas Valet. I'm an innovation team manager in France for a global uh, breakthrough innovation team in Stanley Black and Decker company. And uh, I will explain in detail, uh, not in detail, but quickly how we are working. So Stanley Black and Decker company is Stanley security, camera, uh, automatic doors. It's oil and gas uh, machine uh, for pipeline. It's also an engineering fastener uh, you have in your smartphone or laptop everywhere, in a car also. And there is a big team. Uh, it's a global tool uh, and storage team. And I'm working for that storage team. And basically, we are building, uh, designing tools and storage uh, through all the brands you can see uh, above uh, on, the, on that slide, so uh, up to 10 brands, in fact. So I have some examples to explain you better uh, what market we address today. So one big market we address is DIY uh, through retail uh, market, uh, craftsmen, and, uh, and um, 
and uh, contractors, mainly in US. I'm sure you know some brand like Stanley or DeWalt, no? You don't know Craftman, it's a new brand we just lost in, in US. So basically we are providing tool for these guys. These guys are working to make money. Uh, they are owning their own business and they, they need tools to make business. So that's very important for us. It could be electrician, plumbers, or uh, I would say just um, wall installation in, in, your, in your home, in your office, a lot of uh, activities. But we are addressing also a constru construction site, big construction site in the, in the commercial side, and, and, uh, and uh, we have a lot of machine to cut wood and piece of metals. Safety is a big issue uh, for those guys are working, are working here. Uh, we also are working for people that are building your product you have every day. So in a in, in plant, for, uh, just an example here, uh, in a professional side. So basically here, everything has to be placed at the right place. I don't know if you know 5S rules, all the rules you have uh, in a manufacturing today. And that is very important for us to provide tools and solutions, storage, to answer to all the organization you have behind that picture. Aerospace is also a big market for us. Uh, the needs are totally different. Uh, problem to solve uh, probably bigger. One big problem for those guys, for example, is, not, is to not to lose one tool. If you lose one tool inside a, a plane, you will destroy it. Just because even a small bits, you know, you have in a multi-bit screwdriver, you know, very well that can destroy a turbine because it will be the harder metals you will have in that case. So, for example, we are providing tools with RFID technology inside to be sure all the tools are coming back to the storage after the day, for example. And this is mandatory today for, for those guys. We are addressing also uh, energy um, maintenance guys. Their big issue is mobility. They have to move with all their tools to go inside uh, crazy plants. And I have one example through the video that can uh, give you an idea, a better idea of the constraint and needs and, uh, in, in that job. And basically, it's a product we, we launched a few months ago through Facken Brand. Sur ce plateau, nous sommes une plateforme de formation au métier de technicien de maintenance éolien. Je suis passionné par les aspects techniques de l'éolien et j'aime surtout le travail en hauteur. Elles sont petites de loin, mais imposantes de près. C'est très impressionnant, on se sent tout petit. Suite aux accès difficiles et à l'espace confiné, il nous faut une lampe de qualité. Il faut un éclairage précis et important. On peut la laisser accrocher à soi-même à l'aide d'un petit cordon. Sur le bout de la lampe, il y a un aimant. Ça permet de la fixer sur les parois en acier et d'avoir les deux mains libres. La lampe a une fonction géniale. Trouve ma lampe qui permet de la localiser. Tu la perdras jamais. Appuyez sur ce bouton. La lampe clignote et émet un bruit pour que vous puissiez facilement la retrouver. Mais même sans cette fonction, c'est génial. La nouvelle lampe Facom est très innovante. Je ne peux plus m'en passer pour travailler. As you can see, a big issue everywhere uh, in work environment is the fact that people lose their tools, and sometimes it's very dangerous. We are working also for, just one second, uh, for uh, mechanics, uh, automotive garage, uh, uh, with diagnostic solution. So basically for those guys, uh, the most important thing is how to be able to quickly analyze a vehicle 
uh, for diagnostic solution, uh, and also the new generation of vehicle like uh, electric uh, vehicle now. Super, thank you, Thomas. Very impressive. I hope I can get a lamp because I just fell in love you, with you this product. You can buy a lamp, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with Hélène, we were at home in the restaurant. So with a human in, in some situations. With you, we were on the top of a, of a windmill in a construction site in a plant. Carolina, where are you going to bring us? <laughs> Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to see you, and I will bring you to the world of the office spaces, so now a little bit at work. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I would like to say you a few words about how to design experience in office furniture industry, and I will do it in context of three aspects. So, people, process, and places. Why? Uh, because we do our job for, for the people, uh, to make, make their tasks, make their processes in their work easier, and to take care about place where they work. Uh, so uh, I have a pleasure to, to manage uh, these two uh, different departments. So one is product management department, and second is workplace research and consulting. Uh, but what is, I think, most fascinating is that uh, it is a very interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team, consists of product manager, architects, uh, workplace consultants, so together uh, we, we create our philosophy. So uh, we work in a, in a company which is called Novester Group. Uh, it is the third biggest office furniture uh, producer in whole Europe. Uh, so we are doing a lot of projects in whole Europe and we deliver comprehensive solutions uh, to furnish different public areas like offices, like stadiums, cinemas, uh, cinemas theaters, uh, airports, or stadiums. So you could find very often our project, you could use it, you could use our product and you don't even know about it. Um, so uh, going to the topic, what, what is our motto is to create design which is not ignoring a people. Uh, so we always in our work, when we create new office or we create new product, we would like to avoid the situation like on this picture, that design is going one way, uh, but user experience is totally opposite. So at the end, design is, is not used. So, uh, so going to the, some examples. So the first, our thing which we are doing, so we are producing products, we are producing chairs, uh, desk, etc. So how we do it, how we take care about user experience. So first step, these are designers, of course. Uh, we cooperate with international designers all over the world and they bring to us uh, user experience, they bring to us design feeling. And from the other hand, we have great research and development team with technical uh, uh, experience and also product department with business experience. And together, this, this team, this project team, is working to deliver the proper product. So here you can see an example. And what is, sorry, what is important uh, is that uh, we always uh, keep in mind couple personas when thinking about product. We, we are a B2B company, we deliver to business, yeah? So we have to keep in mind the buyer's perspective, decision maker perspective, architect perspective, but also user perspective as well. So how to do it? So here is a real case. So this is a, one of our newest product, Xilium. And uh, I think that every persona will find something. So for the decision maker, now very important issue is uh, these are environmental friendly issues. So that's why in this chair, 96% of materials which are used could be easy recyclable. From the other hand, for the buyer, the important thing uh, is to have easy product maintenance. So that's why in this chair, every, uh, every part could, could be very easily replaced. For the designers, important is design. So this chair received German Design Award uh, uh, as well. And for the user, for the user, important is ergonomic, it's intuitive usage. So that's why we create 
extra mobility, the newest mechanism, a very unique dual back backrest, which you could see uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the bottom. So we are doing it this way. But what we also know as a furniture producer, that the, pro the product is not enough. So this slide is showing the way of our development. So at the beginning, when company was established in 1992, we are just an office a chair producer. Up, uh, after a couple of years, when we bought different companies from Germany, Switzerland, we became uh, the global furniture supplier. So we start to deliver the comprehensive solution. So not only chairs, but everything what you need to furnish your, your office. But, uh, uh, but now we would like to give our customers uh, something more, something like added value. Because after many years of, uh, of experience, after realizing thousands of projects, we know what kind of mistakes the people could um, avoid in offices, and we know how to do the effective space. So we are thinking in all, uh, always in these three aspects. So to create office which motivate people to better work, to prepare uh, office which helps them to realize their, their task in more productive way, and to advise how to create optimally arranged uh, office, so optimally arranged place. So for this purpose, we are doing different researches for our customers, different consultancy. Uh, and thanks to that, we know, for example, that 76% of employers, they are looking how their future office will look like before they will take decision to take a job. So it is, I think, quite important information. But from the other hand, the average uh, desk occupancy level is only 45%. So the desks are empty, so where, where are people then? So how to, how to deal with that? So again, some case, so this is the part of the report which we done for one of our customer. Uh, so this is uh, one of the graph when you could see what kind of activities employees is doing in offices. So how much time they spend on desking, phone calling, uh, meetings, video calls. But you could also see the difference between employees' perceptions, so how they think, how much time they spend on desking, etc. But from the other hand, what is reality, which we observed. Uh, so that, uh, that kind of data uh, allows us to prepare the, uh, the nice offices. But what I always say that the best project done by the best architect and with the best and the most expensive product uh, will be failure without change management. So uh, we also engage people to the creating the offices. We are doing uh, different workshops, surveys to also hear their opinion. We even uh, let them and advise our customers to let them to vote for the products they would like to use in the in office for the future. Uh, so that helps us to create nice offices uh, proposition to uh, propose different concepts. So it could be normal open space, but it could be also activity-based working office. It could be zonal office. Uh, it could be cellular office. So we are always saying that there is no recept for every office because every company has its unique organizational culture. Uh, what is also, I think, uh, important is that we have product which allows us to create space in different climate. So here you have the real example which we did for our customer. So this is office created in the style of Scandinavian look. And this is the same office created in the more industrial look. So, so this is also important in what climate we would like to have our office. So uh, at the end, uh, we collect our knowledge in different reports. So what are main needs of employees in the offices? What programmers want? Because IT sector is now very important. So thanks to that, we know that, for example, hunger is the most important need of employees in offices. Everyone always think, OK, when is a lunch break? So this is information for us that we should bring more uh, canteen product, more social product, yeah? 
if people are complaining about acoustic in office, that brings us uh, knowledge, okay, we should develop our acoustic portfolio. So uh, this is the model how we work. So we deliver the product, but for the other hand, when we are doing workplace uh, advisory, when we collect our experience, uh, we have contact with, uh, with a user, with a business, and uh, thanks to that, directly, we know how to develop our portfolio, so our product portfolio. So th this, is, uh, this is our motto, that thanks to that, we know how to make the space and also how to make great experience. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you for thinking about me being very hungry at the office. <laughs> very often. <laughs> Which is an easy transition back to, to food. <laughs> With a first question for Hélène. Uh, Hélène putting the, the people at the very heart. You mentioned your people as well. Uh, it looks to be that you are a family business, 150 years. Congratulations. That tells something, sixth generation. Um, my, my question to you is going to be, what do you learn from the patients? You describe the process, which in today's world seems almost slow. What do we learn from that? Um, I think that, f first of all, uh, one has to realize that um, porcelain manufacturers went through difficult time in 20, 30 years ago. And um, I think that today we are very happy to be still here. And the first thing is a sense of pride. Um, and I, I like those two photos because the, the woman on the left, as you can see, is super proud of her product she just finished. She's been there probably 20, 30, 40 years, I don't know. Um, most of the people working in our factories have been there for ages. Um, the, the picture on the right is she entered first in the company, met her husband there, got married, had a child, and the child is now working in the company also. So it's a, it's a family business into a family um, business. And those two images really give the feeling of what the, our manufacturer is all about. Because um, when you make a piece in porcelain, it's like um, 50 different nose how, like a chain. One is responsible for what they do and what they are going to give to the next person. So everyone has a sense of um, responsibility. The thing is, when you glaze a piece, this incredible gesture you saw with the plate in the film earlier. This glazer knows very well to do a plate. He does plates, you know, many times for many years. And then we arrive with a very complex vase made by a designer. He has to invent a new gesture in order to glaze that vase, not in one, five, or ten vases, but for hundreds, for thousands. That is the case for every single know-how. But the miracle of it all is that at the end, when you buy 12 coffee cups that has been hand-painted, they are all completely identical. This is why people think that we are an industry, not a manufacturer, that everything is made by hand. This is why I'm happy today to be able to speak about this, because people have no idea about the fact that um, today in our manufacture, you know, all the pieces have been there made by hand. I forgot to... So these are all the um, know-how that are different. And even though um, we have to keep all those know-how, 
new technologies today allows us to mix both of them in order to do new product or product that we could not have done five years ago or ten years ago. So it's not one, one against the other. It's always the, the, the human is at the center of the, of the production, but those, all those new technologies allows us to stretch the limits of porcelain, to allow every uh, chief in his sector to imagine how we can do better. Because uh, porcelain has changed through the years. People think that it's the same way of doing it for 200 years. Porcelain is very young, you know. It was, it's, it only it dates from the 18th century because it was found very late. The, the Chinese has invented porcelain in the 6th century. And in Europe, we only found that famous kaolin, and it only dates from, so, from the 18th century. So we are the beginning of things with porcelain. And there's also something that I, want to, to, that I want to tell you is that porcelain, people doesn't make the difference between porcelain and ceramics. Ceramics is the family where you have terracotta, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. And porcelain is the only clay that is fired at 1400 degrees, which is the highest temperature. At this highest temperature, it shrinks 14%, and that makes everything very complicated. The shrinkage of 14% obliges you to create molds, and you cannot, it's very difficult to anticipate how it's gonna shrink. A round vase enters the kiln oval, and under that pressure, it will take that final shape. I lost track of what I was saying. Um, sorry. It um, will come back. I, I will ask you another question later on. You can come back to it. Let's follow the hands. I think it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful picture. And, and, uh, and, and Thomas, in what you are doing, innovating for a large, large group like uh, Stanley uh, Black and Decker. I'm sure you are spending a lot of time with people, observing, understanding how they work. Uh, but don't you have some surprises somewhere? Don't you learn from that? Uh, yes, we learn a lot. Uh, and obviously, we need to spend a lot of time with our customer. We, we meet them, we discuss, we co-create also with our customer. We experiment a lot on the field with new solutions. So to explain uh, a little bit better what our, our challenge, uh, so I'm working in innovation team. It, this innovation team is like a special force. Uh, is the innovation team is working like an, uh, a startup, internal startup, outside, I would say, traditional marketing and uh, engineering team. And we have to provide uh, each quarter disruptive innovation uh, with uh, big business opportunity. Uh, basically, we are used internally to push out uh, a traditional marketing team to, to integrate into their brand and their uh, range, uh, new technology and disruptive technology. So to do that, we need to go outside on the field to get the insight from customer. But the big, big difficulty for us is where is the big insight? We cannot answer to every needs. Uh, there is many problems to solve, to be honest. But there is big problem to solve. And a big problem to solve is very interesting because you can provide a big solution. That's our purpose. Uh, and what is surprising uh, on the field is only big problem to solve is very important. Uh, small problem to solve is not so important. And uh, the balance is not easy today to, to figure out. It's not easy to, today to detect the big problem to solve that will change as a way of uh, working from our customer because they didn't know what is the problem to solve in their point of view. And uh, it's easy also to, to, uh, to try to, to, trying to solve a problem that uh, there is no problem, <laughs> that is not a problem. And uh, one other thing is, uh, is surprising, it's not surprising, but we, we have to keep in mind is more simple is the solution or the problem, more we will have success. So people want to solve 
basic problem, simple problem, but this problem can change the, the, the life, in fact. Super, that looks like a, a good learning. Uh, so, so on your side, Carolina, what is the big ideas to solve a problem which I believe we have more and more, uh, which is the fact that you want to make sure people are happy at the office? So what is, the, what is the magical recipe? What did you learn in that area to make sure people will stay? Uh, the first thing we, which I have in mind is to let them work in Google Office. <laughs> so, but you know, it's not always uh, the, the receipt. Um, proper, um, I think that there are now the few things which are important for, for the people, for employees. The, the thing which is the most important for us as a, as a human being now, this is my opinion, is well-being. So how we feel, how is our health, how is our body, how is our mind. And from the other hand, uh, the, the skills which are required for business, which are now very important, it, it is productivity, which was always important. But now more and more important is creativity. So that's what you are doing, yeah? So... Um, Probably you know the Maslow pyramid of need. It is you know very basic theory. What people need to be happy? Yeah. So going to, to the, your question. Mm -hmm. So there is a very similar pyramid done for the workplace area. Uh, that uh, pyramid was done by a researcher uh, Jacqueline Fisher from uh, California University. And in this pyramid we have couple levels. The first level, the, the lowest one, is discomfort. So I feel bad in my workplace. I feel bad. The, the next, the higher leverage, uh, level, uh, is a so-called physical comfort. So, okay, I have basic conditions. I feel safe. This office is very basic, but okay, I'm fine. Uh, the higher level is a functional comfort. So it means uh, that in this office, I have all necessary uh, zones or areas or products which allows me to, uh, to fulfill my function in, a, in the organization. So for example, in, if in my work, sometimes I have to work in silence, concentrate, do budgeting or something like that, I don't have to work always on very cra uh, crowded and very noisy open space. It means that I could go to the silent room and concentrate. Uh, and the highest level is, uh, is a psychological comfort, and, and it is this well-being. So it means I'm motivated, I'm happy when I'm coming to this office. Uh, what is important that crossing every of this level in, in pyramid is uh, increasing productivity. So it is also benefit for, for the orga for organization because always there is a question, what is uh, the boundary, how much we have to invest in office to make people happy. And I always say that it's not a matter of, of the money, it's more a matter of engagement, of uh, nice design, nice thinking, and, and this is, I think, the, the clue how to, how to do it. And last thing about this creativity, there are also some nice researchers that the office in which people are engaged in creating the idea uh, brings uh, higher creative creativity for 37 percent than normal standard office. So, so the, you see the ben benefits are very visible. Yeah. Super. So it looks like you need to come to my office. <laughs> Uh, even though I'm pretty happy Makes at the happy? system. Yes, I'm very happy already. <laughs> um, the, the, when, when we think of what people value the most, that's what you said, basically. We need to listen to people. What do they value the most? One of the big questions for you, Helen, is are your products good for the environment? You know, uh, how do you cope with that? Uh, it's not an option anymore. There is no planet B. Uh, so what is Bernardo's answer to this? Um, we are quite lucky in the sense that we only work with clay. So clay is only um, it's found everywhere on the planet, and um, it doesn't do any harm to, to the to, to the earth. When it's fired, on unlike the glass, it cannot go back to a previous stage. So what we do then is that. 
we we uh, we cut it in very small pieces and we give it away to put under the roads because porcelain is so strong that it's great to put under the roads. Um, in Limousin, in our region, there's a lot of road paved with porcelain. But even better than that, there's a young company in, uh, in the region who realized that the whiteness of the porcelain in the night was very shining. So they mix it somehow. So in the night, instead of um, a village or uh, a bigger village, use a lot of light, you know, on the roads, they have diminished tremendously because the pavement of the road with this porcelain is very um, reflective and helps reduce the, um, the lighting news. So that is something which I found interesting because in the years to come, I think we will hear much more about this kind of how do you use porcelain once it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's fired. The other thing which is interesting is that we have just created some cosmetic pot in porcelain for companies. A few years ago, I would have never told you the names of the brands that um, we work for because usually brands want um, to be very secretive um, about who produce the, um, the content. But in that case, which is very interesting, that with Sotis, which is below, and with Guerlain, um, they came to us for added value. Their customer, especially in the Western part of the world, uh, are very aware and conscious about what we call the Anthropocene era, you know, what, how the human activities harm the planet. And those young generation who can afford uh, expensive cream doesn't want to buy a cream in a plastic pot anymore. So they came to us and um, decided um, to create a pot in porcelain, but bearing our names, as if our names on the pot was an added value and a proof that what they're selling is made in France. That's very new, actually. I don't think that a few years ago we would be able to do this kind of pot. It's only the new technologies today that allows us um, to be able to do, um, to do this. And also the demand is quite uh, important. And as I was saying earlier, what's very exciting is that um, porcelain today is really not anymore only on the table. It's really everywhere. And opening to new markets like cosmetic or architecture or interior decorating, because porcelain has these amazing qualities which nothing I mean, nothing harm porcelain. No water, no fire, no time. Look at all those ships with blue and white Chinese porcelain that were down in the sea, and when you put it up 500 years later, it looks as fresh and clean. Nothing harm porcelain. So it's a material that has fantastic qualities and um, a lot of different kind of companies are searching today this added value for, for the product. Super. So innovation in porcelain. Looks yes. like you are built of porcelain because <laughs> you are shiny. Uh, let's go uh, uh, now, uh, Thomas, into, into the, the process to develop. You mentioned new innovations, new technologies, the same at Black Edecker, of course. Uh, so how do you develop? How do you create tools which are going to create value for the users, but also for the CEO? You know, how do you measure the value, not just for the human using the tool, but also for the human guiding the company? What is the business value? Yes, that's a big challenge. <laughs> so I would say there is three, three challenges for us uh, every day, every time. Uh, the first 
uh, challenge I already explained is uh, to find out the big things to change or the big problem to solve. And that, that's the beginning of the story, but that's not enough. With an insight of just uh, end user needs, that's not enough. You need to go through your, your second uh, challenge is to build an offer with that, a simple offer that your customer can really well understand simple things. And this is take a lot of time. Uh, you need to refine your concept uh, anytime. You need to be sure, you need to, to understand who you will address with that. You need to test it with customer to experiment. But the, the offer, the marketing offer is, uh, I would say, the center, in fact, of, of the business, of the money after. Uh, an insight is not enough. Insight is very good to, for creativity and to define what you want to do, but defining exactly what you will sell to customer is the most uh, difficult things to do, I, I will say. And that's not enough because the first challenge is how do you commercialize that stuff? That's why if it's too complex, it's very difficult to commercialize. Uh, do you have to invest to uh, provide that offer? Do you need more supplier? Do you need more uh, knowledge in technology? So all that stuff need to be, uh, uh, you need to have a response for uh, all that stage if you want to, to, to make money. Only if you solve every, uh, each of these stage of this challenge, you, ca you can have success. That's why your simple things is uh, easier for making money because you address a clear um, needs to customer, so he can understand easily what the tool will provide to him, and you can easily sell it. That's why uh, the technology, um, we are talking a lot of new technology, IoT and uh, smart technology, is not easy today to integrate such technology because they complexify a lot, uh, a lot uh, an offer today, and uh, nobody uh, is able today uh, to uh, sell simple things using uh, such technology like IoT and, and smart stuff. All right, super. So like a triangle between the simplicity of the big idea, the offer, and then the acceptance uh, on, on the market. That to me, uh, Carolina, looks like a bit similar to what you, what you experience designing your, your solutions. You are at the junction between design uh, of the space, the people, and also the business. Uh, how do you make all of those people happy? You know, what is the secret sauce of the right office? Uh, it's it's not easy. Uh, so uh, f first of all is uh, is that uh, we as a product management department we are central department for every country we we operating. So. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, somehow collect different expectations from different countries, different uh, design feeling. So different is in France, different is in Germany, different is in Poland, different is in Dubai. But, you know, we couldn't implement product for every country, so we are trying to fulfill as much expectation as we can, but it is very difficult. The another stage is that we are operating in different uh, segments. So in project segment, in dealer segment, so and uh, again, expectations are, are different. So it is a, a big challenge. So uh, speaking about fulfilling CEO expectation, <laughs> it, is, it is that, how to manage uh, with, with this kind of things. Uh, but regarding the, the business, uh, here on slides, you could see the couple of our project, which we done for our customers. Uh, so, uh, I must say that every project, uh, every customer is a teacher for us because uh, every product, uh, every project is unique, uh, challenges are, are different, uh, so it, it, it teaches us uh, a lot. So, you could see offices, you could see uh, cinemas, theaters, so, so th this brings us also great uh, experience, also feedback from the people which are using. Uh, and also the, the new companies. Here on picture, you see Aport. Uh, this is our uh, n newest, uh, newest company, so Kush & Co, which uh, joined to our company in January. So the new companies, which we also, uh, we, uh, we are buying, they brings us new experience. 
new products, new portfolio, new customers, new way of thinking. So, so this also, I think, push us forward in developing a business. For example, in uh, Qatar, during a championship in, in, in football, uh, we will um, we'll deliver the, the chairs for stadiums for six stadiums. So, so I think it is quite big big deal. And every customer is giving us some kind of challenge. For example, Gamalco would like to try to create office which attract talents. So they are not saying, please give me furniture. Okay, sometimes they are saying this way, but then we always ask, okay, but what is the target behind that? What you would like to achieve in your office? What you would like to, 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 to have after finishing uh, the, the workplace? So, so many, many lessons received from the customers. Outstanding. For some reason, your offices always look nicer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to spend more we time together. We have to together. speak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so uh, great stories about uh, designing products for people by people. Uh, so I think it's very impressive. Thank you very much. But now I have a common question for all of you, uh, which is how do you put that at the core of, your, of the DNA of the company? You know, human-centric innovations, human-centric uh, experiences. It's very easy to say. You mentioned that it's not always easy to develop, uh, but from a, from a management standpoint, from a company driving standpoint, what, 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 how do you integrate this into, you, into the company? Well, the thing is, um, to make porcelain, uh, we still need the know-how, and uh, this know-how won't uh, change or go away even with new technologies because we just mix new technologies with, of course, all these know-how. So the thing is, how do you transmit the know-how? So we work very much on the new generation, on saying to young people today that the intelligence of the hand is as interesting as the intelligence of the mind. One is not better than the other one. If you have a sense that there's something that you're good with your hands, do consider that. And we have a lot of young uh, in our manufacture that the elder look after, try to see where they would be good at. Um, so transmission is really key to um, uh, um, uh, our manufacture. And also, I think that the fact that we have been there for more than 150 years, meaning that all the um, know-how have been transmitted to one generation to the next one, that means that even today we record any new gestures created for a new piece. If I take um, all those new um, pieces that we have made with Jeff Koons, it's about two and a half years of technical development to understand how we can make that piece, how we can create that color that looks like metal. Well, every single new thing linked to that project is being recorded. Photographs have been taken because we don't know what's gonna happen in the next generation and we need um, to keep that uh, very much so. And uh, what also is important is that um, sense of time is not very important when you are a family business. If it takes two years to create something, you, you will go through a lot of trial and you will maybe fail a lot, but you will, have, you will learn so much through the whole process that it doesn't matter if you take one year, two years, three years to make a project, especially with all those new, new markets that we would like to develop because we try a lot. It's not easy. Um, we fail sometimes, sometimes we succeed. So we try to group all that together, transmission, uh, bringing porcelain into the 21st century. That is really what we try to do that way. Thank you. Same question for you, Thomas. Yes. Um, I don't know if you saw in my first slide, we, uh, Stanley Bacanecker, build a, a purpose for the company, and uh, it's fully uh, around uh, human experience, customer. 
uh, our purpose is for, for those who make the world. Uh, that means uh, uh, our customers are, are not our friend, but uh, it's our family. So it's mandatory for us to go out to prove to the CEO uh, that uh, the, that concept of that technology is validated by customer, and we need to have the proof, the video, the result, you know. And um, for example, also it's mandatory for us to uh, to spend weeks with sales teams, and sales teams, the way of selling tools could be in the retail, in a, in a shop, but also for professional side is to to meet the customer with a truck where you can see all the tools we have and sell directly like that. And this is mandatory for each product manager or uh, innovation team also the same to spend time with our customers. So I would say it's like, uh, it's, it's a life for us to, <laughs> to spend time with our customer, to, to, to test the tools and to see with, with them what, what's wrong, what's cool, what, what not. Super, so you can come at home because I have some stuff for you to do. <laughs> so yeah, no, we learn a lot how to do, of, of course. <laughs> All right. Uh, Carolina, how about you? Um, so speaking about uh, human, uh, I, I think that the important issue is now the environment uh, area. Yeah. So, so, so that's why we are so focused now to create eco-friendly products, to make them recyclable or to create them uh, for the marketing, uh, for, from the ma uh, materials which are coming from the recycling. Uh, other, uh, other thing it is uh, well-being. So as I said to you, the ergonomics, uh, the, the ergonomic chair, the, the desk which allows us to, to work in sitting and in standing position because it's better for our organism. Uh, the next challenge it is that we have a very specific situation that for the first time of, ma of uh, many centuries uh, in one office uh, meet five different generations of people. So with different expectations, how they would like to work, how, what kind of products they would like to use. So we very often we are speaking about millennials, about Generation Z, but from the other hand, our society is going older, yeah? So we also should think about these this people as well. So, uh, so, so ending, I think that um, it's, it's more personal feeling that every project is, is a lesson uh, every success is, is a lesson, is an even bigger lesson, but for me, every failure is the, the best lesson. So, so I really strongly uh, believe in the one of the um, Kaizen rule that every problem creates possibility. So, so this is this is how we work. So, we are very ambitious company. We are growing very, very fast and dynamic. But from the other hand, we are doing it still with uh, humility. So, so this is what is uh, specific for us. And I think that people really appreciate that. So thanks. Super, thank you very much. Uh, I would say for the system, it's a privilege to serve companies like you uh, in what you are doing because you create value for people. Uh, so that was, that was a very good session. Uh, do we have some questions in the room? Somebody interested in uh, hand tools, porcelain, offices? Yes, a question. Yeah, thank you all. It was nice to listen to you. Uh, my question is more to Carolina. Um, the question is, most of the office spaces today, you know, they suit the extroverted personalities, you know, the open office plan, and uh, there's a lot of distraction and noise. So how do you make your design more inclusive, um, especially for people who are introverted, so that they can work in a quiet space without much distraction? Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks God we are not doing only chairs and desks. Uh, so to make the, the, the place more, you know, uh, intimate, something like that, we are doing, for example, the soft sitting system with high panels, which, uh, which somehow hide the user and give acoustic comfort. So, so this is one way. Another way is to create the products which are acoustic, so acoustic panels which you could hang on the wall, on the ceiling, uh, in different places which absorb the sound. Uh, another way is to creating the places for phone calling, so phone booths and this kind of, of, of things. But the, the, the thing is to prepare 
properly the space. So as I, as I said before, it couldn't be only open space. The best thing is to advise customer to create different spaces. So not huge open space, but also places for meeting, informal, spontaneous uh, consultation, silent work. So to work on the, on the arrangement plan. All right, super. Any other question? There is one here. Hello. Uh, my question goes to Helen. Uh, you said that uh, you went through a very difficult time 20, 30 years ago. And um, since we are in the human topic, uh, I would like to understand how you're transforming yourself and the business you were in at that time, which was mainly uh, tableware and all those things. Uh, towards uh, projects that are uh, the one you showed in your second slides that are more uh, artistic and which kind of projects you're uh, actually serving today which are different than from that time? Um, I think that the main difference today is that um, we've been collaborating with many, many artists um, and uh, People could be surprised, you know, why would artists be interested in porcelain? Um, in the 60s, of course, it was design because you, we had to create shapes. Um, after a few years, uh, we have the feeling that a lot of shapes have been done, so the next move was contemporary art. And then it, it changed completely because suddenly uh, a, we went from something that was useful and that you could use on the table and elsewhere, and suddenly just a sculpture or something that, that has no function. Um, and that led to something very interesting is how do you create those collaboration? How do you enhance them? How do you make these artists come to you? Why would they come to you? Why would they be interested in porcelain? And one thing lead to another is that we work with many, many, many artists today. Um, one of the reasons probably is that, as I said before, nothing arms porcelain. And when you are an artist with a big ego, you want to be sure that your work is going to stay for a very long time. And porcelain is the ideal material, because whatever is going to happen, unless, of course, you break it, but apart from that, but from that, uh, it will stay as is for, for a very, very, very long time. So from table, we went to contemporary art, uh, you know, to um, jewelry, to uh, lighting, to, and tomorrow maybe it's going to be architecture, medical, who knows. So I think that porcelain has a lot of uh, new era to, to explore. Super, thank you, Hélène. We would stay with you a very, very, very long time, <laughs> but we need to conclude the day. Uh, today was about human. Uh, tomorrow is going to be about space. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, and I wish to see you again soon and to experience your products in all your different fields uh, and, and thinking about the human being at the, at the core of what you do. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.